tôi Good afternoon, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We are here in Denver, Colorado, coming to the conclusion of our first day of coverage here at MWISE. We've got two power pack days. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be co-hosted with John Furrier this whole week. Yeah. We're grounding things. We're grounding things. Our next segment's <laughs> gonna be about using AI, LLMs, threat hunting. A big theme was automating some of those tasks, like threat hunting, which could help people be more productive. Again, one of the key themes here. Yes, indeed. And who better to talk about it than Vicente. Thank you so much for taking the time. You've had a crazy day. Yeah. You came all the way from Spain to hang out with us today. We love Barca. You had a talk this morning, or actually just this afternoon, right before you joined us. Tell us a little bit about what you educated everyone here on. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, first of all. So, uh, as John was saying, we were using LLMs to try to make our life easier, right? This is what we want. Yeah, so it's the magic words right yeah, there, Vicente, yeah. I love it. All the hype around AI. But the thing is that actually it works for different stuff. We are making advances. It's not like we solve security yet, of course, but we are making everyone's life easier. In this case, what we are analyzing is how LLMs can help us to analyze malware binaries, reverse engineering, which basically means spending a lot of time, yeah. needing a lot of expertise to make sense of what the malware is doing. And well, if an LLM can do it for us, that's a, a, a nice uh, step forward. And, and it's a huge time saver, you were saying. Yeah, I mean, this is, once again, one of the most intimidating things that you need to do, and you need a lot of expertise. Now, we are not saying at this point yet the LLM is going to do perfectly like a super expert reverse engineering will do. But it's giving us first like a sense of maliciousness and second, identifying what the malware is doing, which is a great help. It's also helping us to identify inside of the malicious code where are the key parts that we need to analyze. And this is a great help for any analyst because you don't need to spend hours going through the code trying to identify what are the key parts that you need. You can simply, okay, these are the parts, let me create some script to decrypt the configuration file, and suddenly my time of analysis is reduced by 80%. I can't imagine there is a, a cybercrime fighter that wouldn't love to hear that time reduction. Well, everybody likes that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things that was awesome about the keynote, first of all, Kevin Mandy always is a great keynote, um, he's so passionate, and this little deference towards you know, a cyber espionage and all the threat acts out there, he's clearly a hawk in the area. But he did bring up the idea of what CEOs are asking, what would I do before, um, if I could get before the breach, what would I do differently? One of the things that was red teaming more, he loves the round tables, so we can get the plug for the round tables, uh, tabletops he calls them. But red teaming was a big part of the automating of threat hunting, huge yeah. part of the tasks. Can you share your thoughts on how you guys are seeing some of the early uses um, of um, the low-hanging fruit of, the, of, of Gen AI for threat hunting? Is it scanning the code, writing code? What are some of those heavy lifting items or the toil, as you guys call it, that you guys are kind of taking down as first wave, the first wave of use case? Right, so we, we are already in the point that this is a great help for everyone, and it's saving time at a very atomic level. Everything you need to do for this pen testing, for this read teaming, you can use for uh, LLMs to create goals for you, to analyze the stuff, and to give you like the best way to go, to give you an answer to something that is not trivial. Uh, and little by little, we are getting to the point that they are able to orchestrate everything for us and find answers to complex questions and to find alternatives when they, without our interaction, directly depending on the output of whatever they are doing. So we can expect that we can, to some extent, maybe fully automate this in the future. Uh, maybe we can have a constant red teaming exercise going on yeah. and evolving. As long as we are able to use this also to increase our defenses, it means that we would put in things very difficult uh, for attackers. So. You know, what's interesting is that we just did a big post and research on Sierra on digital twins, not from the classic sense of manufacturing uh, article when you saw the economist picked that up, um, our story. Digital twins are going in all operational areas where simulation yeah. could come into play, because this adds value. You could actually run 
simulations, red team simulations, detection response, uh, not just EDR or endpoint, but all kinds of um, detection and response. Could be end-to-end -end workflows, could be AP, what's behind the API, yeah, poke at things. Uh, let, let's think about the low, low hanging fruit, as you were saying. Uh, let's think about social engineering, right? So this is one of the easier things to uh, personalize for the victim and to create the scenarios that are really appealing for them. And once again, if we are able to automate this and to do it on a continuous basis, this will be one of the maybe first ways that we have to, to increase the level of security by uh, uh, people adopting these defenses just because they understand, okay, now I cannot trust absolutely anything and here's the yeah. proof, right? Yeah. But yeah. there's a high degree of customization on top of automation. And I think this is key to make it very clear for defenders how and where are the weakest points for them to, to increase defenses. I think it's an interesting, yeah, I mean, what a puzzle to solve. I'm curious, so you mentioned that you started using LLMs to do this scanning about a year ago. Yeah. Was that, and, and I know you hold a degree in AI, you've been in the AI community for a long time. Was there, was it just the right time? Was it a technology bridge that made it seem to make sense? Why was last, why was a year ago such a moment? Yeah, well, I, I guess uh, when LLMs started getting popular, uh, I tell you, like, all the theory where this is built is kind of all. Uh, I feel like in the past, during our degrees, uh, when we were studying uh, artificial intelligence was just a boring thing, more related to math than anything else, right? And now you see the real implications that look like magic. So actually, it was thanks to the Transformer paper in 2017 by Google that they started making all these models suddenly way more uh, effective, right? Now, um, what was that happened, it was that everybody started using uh, AI to generate code, and it was great. We were starting using by ourselves. Everybody was playing with this, right? Uh, I remember I was asking, uh, can you create a poem uh, on Yara, which is one of the tools that we use for, for hunting? And I was doing that, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. So yeah. next thing I'm going to ask is technical stuff. And they were great at creating code. So the next thing was, okay, you can create code, can you read code? And actually, this is what we are doing when analyzing malware. It's, right. it's just that it's difficult to read this code, or it's too long, or it's too complex, or it's too obfuscated, whatever. But the LLM was doing this almost magically, right? So we had constraints in the past. One of the biggest ones was the size of the prompt that we could use. Now that this is changing, and as LLMs are evolving very fast, we don't have these constraints, and we can throw the whole code like, hey, just give me an answer to this, and, I, and here putting you more context, everything I know, here is a book also on the topic, and here is documentation of an API that you can use. So with all this together, we are starting to get better and better results. Still, we are not there, that, as I said at the very beginning, everything is fully automated, but you had mentioned uh, uh, before we came on camera about writing code, and um, it takes time because you got to kind of—it's crafty. Yeah, I mean, it's not like just reading the manual, just getting code. There's a human kind of craft. I remember when I was breaking into the business as a software developer, craft was a big part of coding. Because remember, there was a shrink wrap thing. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think you think you were in high school then, but I was <laughs> in college. But but uh, those days. Then it became like the lean, fast startup kind of mentality. Agile, Very came in, yeah. Lost a little craft. Now craft is a huge part of situational awareness. Can you share your thoughts on how that blends in with some of these also auto-magical capabilities that come to the table? Yeah. Well, I think is that it, it will be simply changing the role of how we want to integrate all these pieces. I remember in the past, for me at least, when I was also writing code, we need to create everything from scratch. Then there were libraries for everything, which was great. Then it was frameworks, then it was APIs. So in all this process, you are mostly like making a puzzle. And like, okay, how can I interact with this system, with this API, how I can send this in the right format? So it's more like putting pieces together than creating everything from scratch. I guess like what we have now is like, okay, now we have an even quicker, faster way to do that more reliable and we don't need to write all these boring pieces of code. We just need to imagine what is the optimal way and what is yes. what we need to use in, in everything. 
still the human factor is, is needed. You know, it's interesting is that we were talking in our keynote analysis how, you know, in all these ways, there's always either an innovation on the front end or the back end. Web front end, I'd argue, it's not the back end. Mobile front end, cloud back end, right? Yeah. And then now, both the back end processes and front end are evolving with, with this big inflection point. So that's going to create a lot of opportunities. Where do you see that? Because people are really looking at us and saying, wow, both of those theaters are exploding with innovation and creativity, problem solving, it and is. it's an assembly model. It's generating, so it's a, it, it feels like an operating system kind of concept. It's like, okay, just make sure everything's addressable, and then it assembles. But that's a front end, but then the back end's got to be changed too. It's not take, change the tech stack, but not change the process. Mm. I mean, this is kind of a fundamental computer science opportunity meets common sense, human side. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, it is. Uh, I guess how everybody's imagining this. Uh, first of all, I, I can't imagine. So my answer, you, you can disregard immediately because I'm not this person with this vision that can give you something super solid. But everybody is thinking about these agents and this orchestrator, and they are autonomous, and they are figuring out what is needed for every occasion, right? Uh, now, how you have the right checks for this to do exactly what you want and how you want and according to some policies and without hallucinating or... But it looks like code is less important. It's more like uh, the different interfaces that you provide and how you want this to uh, react under different circumstances. So we are maybe moving more to a design of policies, how we want everything to, to react under certain circumstances and the rest will be done automatically which, to be honest, is also intimidating, right? Um, yeah. If you ask me how things work, I have no idea. Uh, I, was very, <laughs> I was very comfortable with my ifs, when, <laughs> yeah. things like that, right? But now, well, yeah, we have this model with these weights and this whatever, but nobody really knows how it works. Uh, well, good luck to us, right? When you, it's part of the adventure. <laughs> <laughs> when you're scanning and when you're looking at vulnerabilities and malware, um, how much of the existing kind of monitoring and observability do you take tap into for value? And what's new? What are some of the new techniques? Because observability is just kind of, a, to me, monitoring. I'm oversimplifying it, but more of a monitoring, keeping track of stuff. Um, it's always changing. Yeah. What are some of the new things that are emerging around you know, that kind of tracking, tracing, services that are being stood up, torn down? What's, what's the state yeah. of the art? I, I think we have more and more signals. And th this is something to take into consideration. The more signals we have and how we use them in a wise way is not a trivial problem. Now, in, uh, in addition to all these signals that we have, I still miss that we need more, in, more data and more information. And all what we are discussing is helping us also to detect what are the signals that we need to pay more attention and to detect trends. The more data we have, the more we understand what is trending, what is surging here that we need to put attention immediately and can replicate in many other potential victims, right? But I still I think we need to improve in the data we get from cloud environments because if you think about your endpoint, okay, here I have my syslog and here I have all the internal logs, but I don't know much what is happening in my cloud environment, right? What is malicious, what happened, maybe I get some alert without any IOCs, without any details. And so this is one thing. And the second is some network telemetry. I think we have mm -hmm. a very poor visibility in all networking elements. And this will be great help if in the future we improve and we do our homework here. I think, I think you just brought up a really good point. No one, it's very hard to see what's going on everywhere all the time and to actually understand that in a way that's actionable given the multiple data sources. I, so you've done a great job of telling us what, where we're at with these LLM scanning malware today. What's necessary to take it to that next level to more of an autonomous stage and how long do you think it'll be until we start to see that at scale implemented? Well, I, I think we can put it at scale now to some level. The problem here is to find a good way to, to really understand when it's working uh, in 99.999% of cases, right? And when it's still we need more help. So that's why we put a lot of emphasis in this decision tree, and this is what we are working now. Depending on the circumstances of what you're analyzing, what is the data you need to provide to the LLM, 
What are the prompts that you need to be using? What are the API function calls that you need to provide to them? What is the output that you need so you can compare this automatically and have these checks and balances to make sure that the answer is right? We are not that far from that, if, if you ask me. Uh, but at the same time, everything is moving so fast that maybe, I don't know, tomorrow there will be yet another LLM iteration and suddenly this is solved, right? Um, but I don't think we are that far from that. It will be at the moment like this kind of 2080 problem. So for 80% of people will be absolutely more than they need. In some cases, we still need this deep expertise and maybe we will need to develop these specialized LLMs just for security, for reverse engineering, etc. But we are not that far from there. I cannot give you a date. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, come on. We want that forecast. We want that prediction. No, it's okay. Oh, sorry. I need to go. No. <laughs> you know, on your talk you just gave, what were some of the questions uh, you got uh, during the talk or after when you get surrounded by all the people? And, and what question do you get most of the time in, in the daily course of your activities with with Googlers and customers. What are right. some of the key things people talk to you about? Uh, I will tell you that the question that I get by far the most is quite transversal to everything, which is, hey, are APT actors using LLMs? Have you found any LLM generated malware? Uh, how are they automating their attacks? And actually the answer to this is non-trivial. Uh, I would say that it's almost impossible to prove because the code that is used to generate some malware, I have no idea who called this. Is someone that you hired, is yourself, you use it on an LLM, you got it from GitHub. It's very difficult to understand where this code is coming from. Unless we find something so uh, revolutionary that we all agree, only, I don't know, this uh, Deus Ex Machina created for us, right? But what we find is a lot of um, social engineering attacks of all kinds with all kind of uh, fraud and it's very easy to replicate. I was using some deep fakes and things like that. I was using some bots used for propaganda and it will be interesting to understand where is the amount of data generated automatically for malicious or disinformation purposes. I guess we are getting to the point that it's almost, dif it, I will not say impossible, but it's, it's really difficult to to see the difference. It's too much noise, and this is one of the biggest challenges I see to distinguish what is noise from what is yeah. valuable. I can totally see that. Wow. Well, we look forward to having you back on the show to update us on where this is going. So exciting to chat to you a year into this specific project, obviously, and really curious to see where it goes next. So thank you so much, Vicente. Thank you to you. That was awesome. We'll have to say hello to you when we're in Barcelona. Please. Yeah, I'm ready for tapas. I don't yes. know about you, yes. John. Yeah, Let's go, baby. Good trip. Yes, and, and I'm very excited to hear from all the rest of our guests this week here in Denver, Colorado. We're at MWISE. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news. Yeah.